So I want to welcome everybody to this high level panel on the science and policy interface. My name is Gabriel Eckstein. I have the honor of serving as the president of the International Water Resources Association. I'm also a professor of law at Texas A&M University uh, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I will serve as your moderator for the panel today and I look forward to an invigorating and informative discussion on the topic. Uh, before we continue, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Rosario Sanchez. She is a senior research scientist at Texas Water Resources Institute, and she will serve as my co-moderator. Rosario will now provide you, the audience, with some basic information. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, the speakers, and thank you for the invitation. Let me go up with some housekeeping housekeeping instructions for all of you. Uh, we invite you to submit your questions in English, please, via the Q&A button below your screen. You will address your questions as much as possible after the talk or in the Q&A session. You will only see each question once it is answered, either verbally or in writing, when they will be displayed for everyone to see. As we have a huge audience today, if we don't have time to answer all the questions, we we'll receive over the next 90 minutes, we will aim to collect written responses from presenters to place on the conference website following this event. Please note that the chat box is disabled during this session. However, we ask you to keep an eye, uh, to keep an eye on, on for useful information messages that we will be sharing this box from the organizers or ourselves as well. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, the speakers today and welcome everyone. All right, so now I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Christine Conte. Uh, she's a public sector specialist at the World Bank based in Washington, DC. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Yan Yan Li. He is the vice president of the International Water Resources Association and a professor at the Institute of Water Resources and Hydropower Planning and Design at the Ministry of Water Resources of China. In addition, we have Jorge Rooks, He's a former national director at the National Directorate of the Environment in the Ministry of Housing, Land Management, and the Environment of Uruguay. And, and we have Connor Quinlan, the scientific officer in the hydrometric and groundwater section of the Environmental Protection Agency of Ireland. And we are also expecting Dr. Patrice Candolu Cabella. Uh, he's a senior program officer for water at the Secretariat for the Southern African Development Community. And we uh, do hope that. Uh, uh, he is able to join us. Uh, there may be some technical difficulties for him to uh, uh, join the, uh, this uh, Zoom session. But um, to begin our conversation, each of our panelists will have five minutes for their opening remarks, uh, focusing on the top of, our, uh, of this high-level panel, which is the science and policy interface. And thereafter, we will engage in a dialogue and open the floor up to questions from the audience. So if we can get it, go ahead and get started. And uh, Kristen, uh, please, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. And thank you, Rosario, uh, very much for this opportunity. Uh, and thank you to all the rest of the panel uh, for being here today. Again, my name is Kirsten Conti. I'm a public sector specialist with the World Bank, and I work primarily in Southern and Eastern Africa on both um, water resources management, as well as uh, what we would call public sector institutional strengthening. So that's really working with um, core center of government, like ministries of finance, et cetera, to improve uh, their operations. Maybe I could quickly request from either Gabriel or Rosario to give me a one minute warning uh, so I can speed up remarks, my remarks as needed. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I thought I would open today very quickly, um, just sharing why I'm excited to talk about this topic and why this topic feels important to me, important and timely to me. Um, I think when I reflect on the science policy interface, uh, I see it as increasingly important because institutions uh, around the world are now facing legitimacy challenges and the science policy interface is increasingly being pulled into the political arena. And in this context, we see that there's a lot of room 
uh, for contestation of scientific evidence um, and that there's potential for reducing transparency about how our natural resources are being used. Um, and in some cases, uh, as some of you have likely read in the news, um, you know, we've seen, for example, benefits that are intended to be for all being captured by few. Uh, this has happened in COVID with uh, PPE, for example. Um, and also, to some extent, we see legal and policy protections for resources being loosened. Um, and so those are just my personal observations of why understanding the science policy nexus is really important right now. I keep calling it the nexus, but <laughs> I mean the interface. Um, so now I'll share a little bit about what we have going on uh, in the World Bank with respect to groundwater and climate change in this area. So we're really working across regions to strengthen the linkages between climate resilience groundwater management and the legal policy regulatory environment. Um, and I would like to highlight a few examples of our work and apologies if it feels like I'm going through the examples fast. I hope we can come back to them during the discussion. Um, but we're working on these issues both at the technical and um, in the institutional level. And central to how we are approaching this are really robust analytics, data-driven science, um, and looking at how strengthening the science policy interface will support the sustainable utilization of groundwater, um, keeping in mind that groundwater is critical for buffering climate, uh, climate variability and that it improves the prospects for poverty eradication, uh, economic equity and economic growth. Um, so what I'd like to do today is uh, what I'm calling a flyover, where I can just share quickly some examples from around the world of where we're engaged. So earlier this year, our water practice uh, began crafting a series of water security diagnostics, and they provide a comprehensive and balanced view of water security. And they also stress the importance of the diverse social, environmental, and economic outcomes that can be gained um, from sustainable water use. They also provide countries with some guidance on how to consider water use within the broader regional and national macroeconomic trends and their development objectives, things uh, such as the SDGs. Um, also at the global level, we're undertaking a new assessment that collates examples of good practices and new approaches to complex water storage issues that our client countries are really grappling with. So these may be in what you may call the innovative space, like aquifer storage and recharge, manage aquifer recharge, um, and also looking at groundwater's role in nature-based solutions um, to uh, climate variability and climate adaptation. Uh, moving over to South Asia, where I think we all know that groundwater has very critical importance, both economically and, and politically, um, it, we are really looking at the water food energy nexus there um, and the role that institutional reform plays in making groundwater use uh, increasingly sustainable. There's been a regional study on groundwater for drought resilience um, that looks at this nexus approach. And um, we've also worked with the government in Rajasthan to explore how solar pumping for groundwater can be used without causing depletion and can also capture those additional benefits of reducing really high power costs, access to power costs um, and power shortages. Um, moving now over to East Asia in China's Turpan region, um, we were looking at um, increasing uh, groundwater overdrafts that farmers were struggling with and striving to increase their incomes and crop yields. So those two challenges really went hand in hand. Um, and through a combination of remote sensing technology, improvements in irrigated agriculture, reforms to water rights, uh, and looking at water pricing, uh, we were able to work with 
uh, the regional government there to reduce groundwater consumption, reduce aquifer stress, and increase farmer incomes by 24%. Um, now I'm going to take you over to Sub-Saharan Africa. If you're still on the plane with me, none of us have been on a plane for a up. long time. Okay, sure, thank you. Um, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're working with SADC to look at drought resilience um, and really integrating knowledge and tools and data to inform the region that is very drought prone. Um, I'm going to skip the other examples that I had, but. I have one at the ready for um, to share about Morocco um, and also about Bulgaria. So please feel free to ask questions on those as we enter the discussion. And just to quickly wrap up, um, you know, not everything I shared here fully captures what we're we're working on at the World Bank, um, but we're really seeing that looking at the water food energy nexus is increasing the space for technical and policy dialogue around groundwater and climate. Um, and it's also helping us to address countries increasing concerns about domestic food security in response to COVID. Um, we're seeing that data and analytics are really critical for building the case for governments to increase monitoring and management um, and highlighting the benefits of offsetting climate vulnerability. And we're also really working at the level of interests and incentives, which can be sticky, um, and looking at how groundwater science can really be leveraged to inform management decisions and sustainability frameworks in a way that addresses the internal workings of government and people's different uh, desires and goals for how they will move forward in their development. So um, I'm very happy to answer any follow-up questions or guide you towards any additional information. Feel free to request that in the chat box. So thank you very much and apologies if I went slightly over time. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, let's move over to uh, Yon Yon, please, if you may. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, as we all know, groundwater is quite important. Like in China's case, uh, actually the groundwater contribute about 27% to the uh, base flow to the runoff, and also the groundwater supplies are counting to about one sixth of the total national uh, water supply. So it's quite important to to the water security in China. So on that uh, aspect, I would like to share some of the understanding and uh, recognition of the importance of groundwater with our uh, friends. And uh, first of all, we think groundwater system is a very complicated uh, system because it have a interlinkage and interactions with the surface water, with the soil system, with the vegetations, with the geological systems. So all the the groundwater was flowing that and uh, interactive among those, those different uh, systems. So it's uh, quite a complicated and unique system. And the second uh, feeling is uh, we think uh, groundwater, although it's usually it's stable because it has a huge uh, volume of uh, storage, but actually their replacement the annual replacement of the groundwater actually is a very limited amount compared with the, uh, the, the storage volume. So that makes the groundwater is, uh, stable, but also quite sensitive to their recharger sources because the major recharger sources of the groundwater was coming from the uh, precipitation from the surface water and also from the irrigations, this kind of things. So it's quite uh, sensitive to the also to the climate change, to the land use, to the urbanizations, and also to the to the to the to the uh, obstruction of the groundwater resources. So we have to look at the groundwater very carefully. And the third uh, feeling we have is uh, 
is the reaction of the groundwater to the human activities, to the influence by human beings is quite delayed. Because when you saw the, most, in most of the case, or many place, actually, when you saw the uh, problems, it's already invisible, it's already uh, unrecoverable. So, so like uh, in, in many cases, uh, if you uh, overuse of the over pumping of groundwater, it's uh, uh, groundwater table was slowly getting down, getting down. But when you dry out your storage aquifers, you got big troubles. And also, when 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 the environmental uh, accident happened or pollution, you keep uh, keep recharging to the groundwater. So it's almost. Uh, uh, almost uh, uh, unrecoverable in some place. So, and uh, once it's destroyed, it actually not only influences the groundwater itself, but also influences the surface water, but also in, in, influences the soil system, influences the vegetation coverage, and also the geological structures, those kind of things. So we think this delayed a uh, uh, factor of the groundwater makes the people have to be carefully look at their uh, mechanism of the groundwater interaction, uh, transformation, those kind of things, but also carefully look at the policy aspects for the groundwater governance. So. And also, last but not least, we are thinking about the, the groundwater have the multi function. Uh, first of all, it's have a function to provide the, the 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 water to the surface to the to the surface water and uh, take a very important role in the whole global water uh, <laughs> circle. As I mentioned in China. Like our base flow is contribute about uh, nearly one third of the total uh, surface water, and also in the planning area, groundwater is also provide a very important role in the water supply and the water water circling, and also particularly uh, provide uh, the sufficient uh, uh, evaporation for the plant. So, and also it have. Uh, the resource functions because the groundwater is easy to access, so people can easily to to dig the uh, the wells and you pumping the water you know, for for drinking water supply for irrigation or for other, for other purpose. So it's 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 uh, make the people not not have the very strong incentives to to protect to 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 save. To efficiently use the groundwater, so it's uh, also have the function of the resource functions, and all, of course, it have a very important role in the to support the ecological security uh, securities. So, with this function and also multi uh, use of the groundwater, it can be used for drinking water, for irrigation, for industry use, and also because it's uh, usually the the amount is stable, the quality is quite good, so easy access. So people like to have this groundwater, but that, then you are, you'll find that in most of, most of place, it's, it will be lost control because most of this groundwater, the, the, the big issues happened by the larger scale, the individual users, like in North China Plain, we, 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 we have about uh, more than 10,000, 10,000, uh, 100,000 10, square kilometer with, with uh, groundwater depression, uh, heavy depressions. Uh, in some place, even this aquifer has been dried out. So come need to, to wrap up. Yeah. So when we come to understand this uh, characteristic <laughs> of the groundwater, so we think it's quite important. All the action, all the policies, all the, uh, the, 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 the behaviors of the use of the groundwater 
have to be based on the scientific basis. But now, unfortunately, people is not still very clearly to know the whole story of the groundwater science. So we needed to very, very strong interlink interlinkage and also interactive between the scientific aspects and also the policy aspects, as well as the management aspects, governance aspects, pricing aspects, and, uh, and others. Thank you very much, Gabriel. All right. All right. Thank you, Yan Yan. Uh, let's move on now to uh, Jorge, please. Hey, thank you, Ignacio, for the invitation, and thank you to the organizer to be part of this important conference. I have a problem, but also I, I have a resource. Uh, my problem is that I am practically uh, blind and it's difficult to do this presentation, but also the resources to use the lecture of my computer. Then let hear please what I say from the, the voice of my computer. I understand the interest on my participation is as a political person, with some technical background related with groundwater governance and management. Previously, let me say that today we need to work under the new global scenario generated by the coronavirus pandemic. As we are under its impact, we need some time to react and to consolidate new means and tools to afford the challenges for the sustainable use of groundwater. Science, technology, and innovative forms of work have a lot to do to support political decisions for the sustainable management of groundwater. The causes and consequences of the pandemic reaffirms the substantial role of science in the new scenario in which water have a significant place for the pandemic combat. It is worth remembering it lack or shortages in poor settlements. Groundwater is there for sure, but today it may not be accessible for them. The lack of water security aggravates pre-existing challenges, but also opens new opportunities for its remediation. What about scientific knowledge and its interface with groundwater policies? It's important to remember that the object of the scientific interest, groundwater, is invisible. Science tell us that groundwater is linked with other waters as part of the hydrological cycle, its volume is 100 times greater than the volume of fresh water in rivers and lakes and have a wide geographical distribution. Groundwater flows or is confined in geological formations, aquifers, the quality is generally good, depending on the geological formations with which it is linked. In general, their flows are complex, flowing slowly from recharge areas to the discharge areas. Groundwater extraction requires drilling wells with local incidence. In this context, it is particularly important to take account its natural services, critical for the life and quality of the related ecosystems. It is common for countries to have aquifers at the borders with transboundary waters. The behavior of these groundwaters is different from the behavior of water in transboundary rivers and lakes. Climate, its variability, and change and the land use, condition its recharge and determine changes in its use. The great responsibility for policy is to set clear objectives for groundwater protection and use, and to define guidance and to implement actions to achieve them. That is, to set out where we want to go as a society, and how we do it. The construction of public policies has a fundamental social dimension, it is not only a responsibility of politicians. At its core, a good policy implies stakeholders, organization in behind, and public participation. If people are well informed and educated, it will surely be more adjusted to achieve the political objectives. As public policies for the management of groundwater advances, the need for its governance becomes more and more important. Today this issue is raised in the Latin American region where countries have developed technical and institutional capacities. An interesting experience under construction at the regional level is the creation of the Regional Center for Groundwater Management for Latin America and the Caribbean, Ciregas. It is a UNESCO Category 2 center based in Montevideo. Its objective is to support for governments of the countries to strengthen the management of groundwater. To this end, the center builds capacity in the region, associated with academic sectors, 
collects and generates information, creates links and synergies for local, national, and regional activities. It also promotes projects and collaborates in their execution for which it manages their financing under the UNESCO rules. It is currently starting the implementation of a second project for the Guarani Aquifer System, which is financed by the GEF, together with the Latin American Development Bank, CAF, which begins regional monitoring, information sharing, gender equity, and in-depth analysis of the conditions imposed by climate change. Basically, as a point of start, we need to afford the status of the groundwater knowledge and policies already in place. The scientific knowledge of groundwater and its management have had a smaller and more recent development than those deployed for surface waters, there is less consideration in education, public opinion, and legislation. The importance of the resources role in development has changed in recent decades, accompanied by greater awareness of its social, economic, and environmental importance and its services and vulnerabilities. To the extent that aquifer systems are invisible, and society in general is not aware of its recharge and discharge areas, their protection is not implemented. It is common for drilling to be carried out without a basis in scientific and technical knowledge and without care. These are points of fragility and contamination. The relative low cost of groundwater extraction has been another factor in the lack of control and unsustainable use. There is a diversity of positions regarding the legal status of groundwater. The legislation is less developed than for surface water. It is not possible to ignore cultural factors that have historically been linked to groundwater, its uses, and rights. Its value for indigenous peoples, traditional peasants, or for the poorest social sectors whose survival has depended so much on access to water from springs and shallow wells, must be recognized. These socially vulnerable sectors are the most exposed to climate change disasters. It has been observed that there are differentiated relations according to gender in the access to and the use of groundwater. Countries claim sovereignty over groundwater. It matters above all when it comes to transboundary water aquifer systems that require coordinated treatment and the development of concerted policies among the countries that own them with specific approaches. There is no doubt that good groundwater management requires clear political objectives, in understanding its systemic function and the availability of correlative scientific information in the public domain to encourage commitment. Therefore, scientific knowledge, information, and communication, education, increased awareness, informed stakeholders participation, development of legislation and institutionality are links that mark groundwater management, but not in a temporary linear process, but as an integrated system that is energized from any of these spaces in response to dynamic needs in continuous change. In the science policy interface, in cases it is the science that pushes for the development of policies, in other politics or public awareness calls for scientific responses, and in cases culture and practices impose policies and knowledge. Okay, this is my presentation. I am now open to participate in the question. To respond okay. to people can have. Thank you for thank. the solution. Thank, thank you, Jorge. We'll move to Connor, and then we'll start the uh, the the uh, discussion and the questions. So, Connor, please. Thank you, Gabriel. And I'd just like to thank the IWRA for the invitation to speak today. It's a, obviously a very important conference, and I, I very uh, much appreciate the the opportunity. Uh, so I'm here in my capacity as a participant in the European Commission uh, Working Group on Groundwater. And this group was set up to, I suppose, aid in the, the common implementation across the Union of the groundwater aspect of the Water Framework Directive, water framework directive and the Groundwater Directive. It comprises of a technical working group that meets twice a year um, to discuss uh, views and, and approaches to common implementation in the wide range of environments and hydrogeological environments we have across the European Union. The group uh, typically consists of between 80 to 100 participants and, and it meets um, in, in a different city every six months. It follows a, a participative approach um, that is, I suppose, two-way. And uh, the idea is that we co-create progress and that there's a two-way exchange of views between the scientists and the policymakers and the administrators 
so that you know the, the, as as was just mentioned there by Jorge you know sometimes it's science that drives the the science policy interface and sometimes it's 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 policy that drives the interface and this group allows for that two way exchange to happen the group is made up of i suppose representatives from eu competent authorities uh, research institutes academia industry and ngos and it's a fluid uh, it's a fluid membership so as as i suppose topical items come up and uh, such as climate change, the, the membership can be modified to accommodate those that need to be there. And in each meeting of the working group, there's always, you know, there, there are standing tasks of the working group, and there is also a dedicated section on research and innovation. This is driven mainly by, um, I suppose, input from the research community. And this is, I suppose, to inform the wider group and inform the policymakers of scientific advances in the groundwater area. In certain cases where there are quite pertinent topics such as climate change, uh, specific workshops are held, dedicated workshops where additional uh, participants may, may come along and it, it just allows those issues to be delved into in more detail and I suppose to set out long-term plans. Um, and it is from one of those workshops that a current task that we're working on in relation to looking at how the issue of climate change can be brought in to the Groundwater Directive came about. Um, there's also um, under the group periodic uh, joint and participative um, approaches to setting out research priorities linked to the groundwater field. Um, and these can be used as a basis, these priorities can be used as a basis to push for, um, you know, different levels for research topics, be it at national, regional or, or European research programs in an individual or in a collective way. And that, I suppose, ensures that the science that is needed to inform policies is likely to be produced and that the scientists stay informed of the, the pressing policy issues in the union. And this is, I suppose, an ongoing and a, and, and a fluid area. Specifically in relation to the science policy interface as regards climate change, there's a dedicated technical activity has recently started um, under the working group to examine groundwater uh, climate change issues and how we start to account for them. The water framework directive that governs, I suppose, European water law was, was set up 20 years ago and climate change wasn't mentioned in the water framework directive because it's hard to believe now, but it wasn't as topical at the time. So, you know, it's high time that climate change was brought in in some detail into the workings of the directive and, and its assessments. Um, and it, it throws up very interesting technical issues in that, you know, a lot of our technical assessments are done on annual averages, whereas in many parts of the European Union and even farther afield, your averages in some cases in an Irish context, for example, of our small island, our averages may not change that much, but our winter and our summer levels in terms of groundwater levels, winter rainfall, summer droughts, that might change significantly. So our variance could increase massively. And currently our assessment methods don't take account of that. Um, another issue that we're, I suppose, quite interested and concerned in is the attribution side of things. Again, you know, this is a contested space. We're going to have to be sure um, when we do, I suppose, come to scientific conclusions about the likely impact of climate change or indeed the observed impact and how we move from seeing changes in groundwater behavior and attributing them clearly and defensively to climatic changes. That is an important step that has to be very carefully done and standardized and it has to be defensible and it has to be clear. So this task, I suppose, that we're working on at the moment has a number of, of, of aims. The first is to look at, um, at a European level at the robustness of how we can account for observing um, and isolating climate driven changes in groundwater behavior, how we monitor those, how we should monitor them. Do we have sentinel sites? What, what other factors do we need to take into account? land use change when we site monitoring networks so that we can actually identify where we have or hadn't had climate driven groundwater changes and um, we're also looking then at prioritizing uh, further research or, or work areas that will need to be undertaken i would i would imagine immediately such as the, the quality impacts on groundwater driven by climate change um, governance changes that may be required you know, higher level changes in terms of, well, if this annual average method for some of our assessments doesn't work, what direction does that need to go in? These are all things that need to be considered and primarily the, the, the quality side, the task we're looking at at the moment is, is, is focused on looking at groundwater quantity changes driven by climate change. We need to put in place uh, work 
to tackle the, the quality changes that may be driven by changes in nutrient concentrations under different climatic futures and, and, and such like. So this is, you know, it's informed very strongly by ongoing science and it's to write the guidance and inform policy, you know, taking that science fully into account. And we're currently just final, um, finishing up a questionnaire that's been um, distributed to the working group members to try and, I suppose, um, gather the current state of science in these areas and distill them down into the relevant conclusions that we need to inform our work. And, and you know, this is a two year task that hopefully we will have moved the, 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 the dialogue on somewhat and improved our guidance at the end of it. In the, in the wider context, then, I suppose, in the European Union, our water laws are, you know, they're, they're under review. The Water Framework Directive just passed a, a fitness purpose review. The Groundwater Directive annexes um, will be reviewed soon. The Drinking Water Directive, etc. And in those, the, the Working Group Groundwater allows the, the Commission to take full account of scientific progress. For example, you know, emerging contaminants such as PFAS or microplastics some cases and that sort of thing. So this is a very intentional two-way lead you science policy interface that, you know, is designed to facilitate this. And I suppose it's, you know, it's becoming clearer that climate change is a wicked problem that, that goes cross sector and your water issues and climate change will impact transportation and impact health and impact tourism and everything else. The fact that we have such, I suppose, a, a a respected and um, informed science policy interface. It will allow us to tackle that and to get the, the, the technical issues distilled and clarified and presented to inform policy. And, you know, given that, um, especially with regard to climate change, we're, we're looking at many parts of Europe, more frequent and more intense flooding, more frequent and recurrent droughts, multi-annual droughts, where the likes of, for a country such as my own, conjunctive use of groundwater, which has never really been that high in the agenda, that's now something that we're going to have to very carefully consider in the future. And, you know, the, the likes of the Groundwater Working Group as a, an intentional science policy interface will be, I think, crucial in addressing those issues going forward. So uh, I'd just like to thank you very much and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you all for this, uh, for your uh, presentations. Um, so uh, what I wanna do is I wanna just to start asking a number of questions and then we'll turn over to, uh, to Rosaria and also the questions from the audience. Um, one of the things that uh, all of you have touched on in your presentations is the, the, the science to policy interface and how we, we, we gather information and data and translate it and bring it over to, to the policymakers. A couple of you, I think um, Jorge and uh, uh, maybe a few others, touched on the other side, which is how do you take the uh, policy information and decide we need more data, we, we need more science, we need more information. How do we go from the policy to the science and inform the science to say, we need more research on these particular uh, uh, topics and areas? What, what is the mechanism that, that uh, you think we can use to go not just from the science to policy, but from policy to science. So I'll open up the floor to anyone who, who would like to uh, address this. Please, Jorge. Now, yes. Yes. Okay. No, but they say this, uh, this the, the science and information and the political uh, decisions uh, depends in, in particular situation in, in the different countries. Uh, in some cases, groundwater is essential for development, have a very strong role in supply, water supply, in irrigation. And in this case, it's for sure uh, the pressure of the, the, the producers or the users make the, 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 the pressure under the political uh, institutions uh, to take decisions. But in some cases, the academic uh, in the research uh, have some conclusions about the importance of some particular situation, for example, contamination of the water. And then they decided to take, and they, they have the links with the government person to, to, to uh, convince the, the, to take decisions about, about this. 
I think it depends in each one of the countries, the, the situation we have in the institutional development, in the capacity of the academic and the areas where the academic or the researchers are uh, organized to, to deal with the problem of groundwater. And, but what is important is the initiative. Uh, what is important is what to, to, to have uh, the organizations at the social level to follow the, 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 the needs and to uh, have the dialogue with the different actors to, to solve this. this All right, thank you. Does anybody else want to touch on this? Um, Yan Yan, please. Yeah, that's a very uh, good question. Is uh, uh, actually uh, in, in many cases is uh, always the the scientific activity was coming from the policy or from the political requirement. So actually, I think uh, uh, after the, the 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 policy or political requirement have been issued or identified, like like say, every country, they have a policy to ensure their water security, food security, these kind of things. Then actually we need some technical people uh, or policy makers to uh, divide this target into different actions. And it is to develop the action plan. And within this action plan, Actually, you need uh, technical as uh, scientific aspects, research as uh, aspects, modular aspects. So we we can follow that tracks. I think from policy to the uh, action program or action frameworks. Then from that uh, action frameworks come to the uh, grassroots uh, fundamental basis or the information you need, the, the, the method you need, the, 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 the uh, rehabilitation techniques you need, those kind of things. I think uh, we can make uh, some transformation from this policy to the scientific uh, aspects. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, let's turn uh, to Rosario. Uh, I know you've been monitoring the uh, Q&A box and if uh, there's uh, particular questions you think are noteworthy. Yes, Gabriel, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Well, we have a lot of questions, but I think uh, we can go over some of this. And uh, this is um, this is very interesting. Uh, this is to Dr. Connor. And the question is this. From an urban Indian perspective, we simply do not have the time or the resources for an optimal science policy interface. We're talking about timing here. How should one go about suboptimal, doable solutions on the ground as we work towards optimality? Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a very interesting question. And I suppose um, even when you have a good, uh, you know, working science policy interface set up such as the European Union, it's a bit like an oil tanker. It can take a long time to, to change direction because you know it's in a it's in a pattern, um, and it has a work program. So even bringing climate change into the likes of the water framework direct, you can't do it overnight. So um, I would say, you know, if you have to again, I this is you know not an area I have huge experience in in setting something like this up from scratch. But I'd imagine you should plan for the long term. Um, your your long term science policy interface plan for that. Try and you know don't neglect that while you put something short term into place because you're going to need something permanently anyway. So I would say you know as much as you can think strategically, um, while you know whatever ad hoc solution you have to take, and it may be similar to the solutions that were put in place at the beginning. We'll say of the European Wide Water Framework Directive nearly 20 years ago, where you literally had administrators and research institutes and geological surveys from across Europe meeting up and they literally just started to meet and started to talk and I think meet talk and be open and you know that if you, if you get your principles right I think it's amazing what you could do quite quickly but um I would say maybe don't neglect the strategic long-term goal either if hopefully that answer is, is of some um use thank you 
We, we have another question. This is for, for all of you. Uh, there is an asymmetry in the impacts of climate change on groundwater. So it doesn't affect everywhere equally or even physically. In this context, what schemes of global governance would you think will be will need it to have an important role? Virtual water imports, exports, for instance, transboundary management. What are your thoughts on that? Anyone, anybody wants to give it a shot? Jorge? Maybe it's, it's, it's important the, to take into consideration that the, the country have the different policies related with uh, climate change and it depends on uh, the, the particular situation of employment of the, of the country. But uh, the, 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 the issue is that uh, you, you need to start uh, for concrete aspect to have some uh, solutions and some results in, in the process. And then you, you can start from, from uh, for example, uh, uh, activities related with the uh, protection of, of the aquifers and the, the use of uh, energies that are not uh, related with the uh, fuel or fossil uh, resources uh, to, to, to go ahead with, with some particular uh, solution and to show that you can succeed in the, in the, in the relation of groundwater with, with the, the, the climate aspect. Go ahead, Connor. If I could uh, yeah, come in on this, I suppose it's as much a question about the just transition and I told you and development goals as it is a technical groundwater question from a technical point of view. You know, the, the comparable data across boundaries may be an issue that's important here, but it, it is a just transition question. And it is a case that, you know, it's it's maybe outside the, the technical realm, but it's definitely um, something that we were going to see it, I think, in most, if not all countries. And it's, it's something that um, is going to have to be developed in years to come. But I think it it is firmly on the on the sociological side of the of the of the field rather than the than the technical. Thank you. Yuan Yuan, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I, I think uh, as I mentioned, the groundwater is also sometimes is quite sensitive to the climate changes, and uh, so there's a concept that we should. Uh, uh, change for the people, for the managers of the groundwater, to take the groundwater resources as uh, uh, strategic reserve resources. So when you regularly use that, you have to limit yourself within the boundary and left some groundwater for the uh, for the for the special case uses, like a continuous drought, like accident of the uh, 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 issues. So in that time, maybe the groundwater is the only source to solve, to save the people. So we should change that concept. Thank you. Thank you. If I can jump in here, there's a question that uh, I, I do want to um, present to everyone, and maybe to start off with Kirsten. Um, so we're talking about the science policy interface. So we've got scientists and we've got policymakers, but where, where are the stakeholders and where are the beneficiaries in this process? Uh, and what role could they have, or, or do they even have a role in this? Thanks, Gabriel. Very important question. Um, and I think, at least personally, I, I always do a lot of check-ins with myself when, when doing this type of work about, okay, where are the beneficiaries? What are they saying? Have we asked them? Um, have they been thoroughly consulted? And at least in terms of the world bank. Um, some people may be aware of our environmental and social framework, uh, which is a couple of years old, but essentially um, 
enables us to work with countries to look at different um, interventions and look at the full range of consequences for potential stakeholders and beneficiaries. And that often includes uh, things like feedback mechanisms, um, maybe that's convening meetings, uh, maybe that's using digital tools to gather feedback, um, maybe that's um, having some sort of grievance redress um, during the process of addressing these challenges. Um, but to answer a bit more, more broadly, I think really centering the stakeholders is critical because often um, a challenge that I see is that the stakeholders that are most directly impacted, those that actually need groundwater resources or water resources more broadly to, to survive day to day, they're not really removed from the resources themselves uh, very much. They can tend to be in more rural or remote areas. They tend to not have great lines of communication with central decision makers. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to really make sure that we're still um, staying in contact with those communities and giving them clear ways that they can express their concerns um, and let us know where the, the difficulties they are, um, are are resting with them. So I, I hope I've answered your question. It's a, it's a very difficult challenge in a lot of places, um, especially with communication technology not always having fully penetrated um, the more remote areas. Anybody else? Uh, yes, Jorge, please. Yes, I, I, in my presentation, I, I insist that stakeholder participation is essential. Um, to have a, a stakeholder participation, in some cases, came from the, the, the users that are the stakeholders. And the users of groundwater, but uh, what's essential is always to have the policy to inform, to have a transparent information about groundwater and the use of groundwater and the management of the groundwater, and to uh, bring the the research capacity in in support of the stakeholders for for a dialogue. That to, to build the link between stakeholders, politicians, researchers, and the, the, the different situations that you have to resolve. I, I think it, it's essential to have a, a long-term uh, management to have the involvement of the stakeholders. So let, let me just follow up on, on both of those comments because I wonder if the decision-making process, because we talk about science to policy, science informing policy, and then also policy informing science in terms of what research needs to be done. But in terms of the decision-making, you, 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 know, you, you both just talked about having stakeholders involved uh, and commenting and providing feedback, but the decision-making, is it a, should the decision-making be only by the policymakers? Is there a role for the stakeholders to help make the decisions? What about the scientists? I mean, should they all be making the decision collaboratively or do they just inform the policy uh, and, and the policy makers? Jorge. But what you say is, is, is exactly, the, you need to work co co together, a stakeholder with the a researcher uh, and, and the, and the policy the politics, the, 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 it's, it's, it's essential to have the, the link because groundwater is part of a system and this system uh, involves different actors and these different actors in, in part are the stakeholders, in part are the politicians, in part are the, the, the researchers or uh, the, 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 the different, uh, uh, to resolve the different uh, uh, aspect related with the water management. Then I think it, it, not only the, the politician take, took the decision, uh, the politician at the end can take the decision when you have the, the clear support of the users, the clear support of the academic. If not, you, ha you have a, 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 
a, a conflict in, and not a dialogue. Great. Would anybody else want to uh, jump in? Uh, Connor, please. And then. Thank you. Um, I suppose just in terms of the example of the, the European Commission Working Group that I discussed already, you know, stakeholders are, are an important part of that group. And, you know, historically, maybe there have been um, uh, in, information uh, asymmetry in terms of, you know, some of the stakeholders would just not have had access to some of the information, the technical information, etc. I suppose, you know, it, it's it's a politician or a policymaker's job to come up with policy and to govern, and it's a scientist's job to, to do science. Um, if, if we start mixing those roles, you know, is a scientist a scientist, is a policymaker now a scientist, et cetera. I think, you know, how the working group works so effectively in these type of science policy interfaces, especially since the, the age of the internet, shall we say, they're transparent and everyone can see the information that was provided and how the decisions were reached. So, you know, policymakers will make policy, but the information, the evidence base they use to make the policies is available is openly available and can be questioned and if it's um if it's not plausible that's open to, to be contested and i think that's you know it's a very effective way of ensuring that that this i suppose that stakeholders do have a voice and that they are listened to uh, yan yan please uh where uh where i i think i i like to share a, a, a case uh, in, in China, uh, like uh, we currently we have a big program is called the North China Plant Groundwater Rehabilitation Program. So we spend a lot of money to uh, to build some uh, surface water irrigation system to uh, instead of the groundwater irrigation system because it used to be a lot of the groundwater uh, used for irrigations. And also uh, to conduct the uh, source to north water transfer to replace the uh, urban water supply by the surface water. Uh, so how to engage and involve this stakeholder to, to be participated in that? The, 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 we have a policy is uh, first uh, to build the mechanism, second uh, to build the uh, engineer structures. So we ask uh, each of the local government to set up the mechanism to involve the stakeholders participation and uh, in increase their incentives for saving water, use, use less of the groundwater. And uh, only two uh, very uh, important uh, instructions I think uh, is very effective. Number one is pricing. So if you get the price of the groundwater higher, so they dramatically reduce the use of the groundwater. And the second is uh, what do we call the we we set up a, a, a water rights according to the sustainable yield of the groundwater for each piece of land. So it usually is about uh, two thirds of the normal. Uh, uh, amount of water currently they are used. So with these two instructions, uh, the automatically the stakeholders, the farmers, will be will get to be organized and participate in the whole process of this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, let's move back, Rosario, to some of the questions we have from the audience. Yes, we have a lot. But I, I, wanna, I wanna bring up at a point that kind of en encapsulates a couple of these questions that refers to communication. Uh, everything that we're talking about, policy science, connection, stakeholders involvement, decision-making process, uh, science and politicians or decision-makers communicating. We are, are assuming that we are actually communicating, right? So, at, at the end of the day, probably that communication is not really efficient because we're not getting to where we need to get when it comes not just groundwater or climate change, but all of those both together, it's even a greater challenge to talk about. So I guess my question would be, uh, how, what are the key elements for truly uh, effective engagement 
with all the stakeholders in order to pursue all the objectives that you've been pointing out in terms to get to that. So sometimes that communication link is not working or sometimes the, the problem between that communication is precisely the communication strategies that we're using. So I, I, I wanted to bring that up to you because that kind of brought a little bit, a couple of the questions that we've seen here in the audience. Christine, do you want to jump in on that? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I hope I can give a quick answer because that, that triggered a lot of thoughts and, and it's a really, really important question. So I think for me, there are two dimensions, right? There's the dimension of what we kind of typically think of in the science policy interface, which is, are the scientists able to effectively communicate really complex technical issues to policymakers in a way that's going to facilitate uh, sound decision-making. And I think that that is a particularly acute problem with groundwater because it's complex and because we also like to do things like talk about geological formations from the Paleolithic area, era, era and you know these kinds of issues. Um, and so I think there's some of that that still needs to be smoothed out in the groundwater uh, community. Um, and then, and that's not just for talking to decision makers, that's also for talking to um, people on the ground, users on the ground who are dealing with these issues every day because um, their metric for um, conceptualizing what is happening with their resources may be fundamentally different, but equally important. And so um, what comes to mind there is how do we, uh, I may be reposing your question <laughs> and not answering it, but I think um, the answer is somewhere in um, not necessarily trying to bring us into a common language. I'm not sure that that will um, be efficient or even possible, but rather creating space where everyone can come to the table with their concerns and there's room to calibrate them against each other and really understand the true nature of the problems and concerns and then position them in a way that um, the parties who need to respond can actually take effective action. And I, I see that that is often really missing. So when I was doing my PhD research, I did it in Southern Africa region and people in the communities there really have a, a extremely solid understanding of what's going on with their groundwater resources, but they're not gonna say it the way a hydrogeologist is gonna say it. Um, so, um, how do we how do we get everyone in the room, get those lines of communication going, and also increase people's perception of the different perspectives, allow them to feel like everyone's perspectives are equally valid. And, and this is hard. This is where it becomes really contextual about um, cultural understandings of hierarchy, cult, um, people's perception of levels of education, things like that. So um, it's really complicated. Again, not sure I answered the question, but for me, it's about creating space and continued engagement um, and also not wanting a person with one vocabulary to become another person in order to make this dialogue effective and move it forward. Thank you. Does anybody else want to touch on this issue of communication? Yeah, Connor. Yeah, I could, if I could make a point on this because it's an issue that I think is is highly pertinent. Um, you know, hydrogeologists speak about hydrogeology, and you know, you take most policymakers now, or a lot of stakeholders even, they will struggle to understand hydrogeological concepts in the current time or present situation. Um, not to not to start talking about a range of different futures with high uncertainties. That's where you really lose people. And if you look at um, the language that climate scientists use, it can be quite 
intimidating and it, it can be too much for, for even technically minded people to handle sometimes. So you have climate scientists talking about a range of potential futures under CMIP5 and they talk about the new CMIP6 ensemble and they say, well, you know, the, the projections are worse, but the uncertainty has increased. I've seen hydrogeologists when that information has been presented with, to them. I've seen very technical people kind of, you know, shrink back a little bit and say, OK, this is this is these projections. There's a lot of uncertainty here. This is highly complex. I I'm unsure of where I'm going here. Now, if you layer that on top of hydrogeology and then go and talk to policymakers, you're in you know, a space where you're using impenetrable concepts and very abstract concepts and highly technical language. It's for the experts, it's difficult. never mind for a, a generalist civil servant, shall we say, or even an ecologist maybe who doesn't have this type of background. So I think the message has to be exactly as Kristen said, it has to be phrased from the perspective of the receiver. And that has to be very consciously and carefully done. And be that the corporate risk register or something like that, you know, the the language and the perception of the recipient, it has to be absolutely and fundamentally aimed to them. I'm stating the obvious there, but we forget that sometimes. I mean, you know, we can talk about, we'll say CMIP6 climate futures where we have a range of possibilities, you know, and a range of hydrogeological responses to them. And you can get very technical and very interesting and, and uh, you know, in information like that, whereas it has to be boiled down to something like, look, there's a lot of uncertainty. We have a range of futures, none of them are good. And we have to work from there. And it has to be that straightforward. That's that's just the point I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yan Yan? Yeah, two aspects. From the scientific aspects, uh, we got to convert the scientist, scientific solution, scientific uh, language into a simple, understandable, and an easy access, easy understand uh, languages. Like uh, I, I give, give, give you an example, like uh, uh, again, the rehabilitation of groundwater depletion in North China is quite difficult. So we convert this uh, action is to the, uh, one side is to, reduce the uh, consumption and the use of the groundwater. And uh, in other words, is just increase, to increase the recharge of the groundwater. So that's two, just the two words, that's easy for the decision makers, policy makers and uh, politicians, easy to understand. And from a politician and uh, policy aspects, the people, they ought also to change of their mind to be what they call the programmer-oriented or pro, 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 programmer-oriented and uh, objective-oriented approach to face the, the issues and the problem and uh, to set up the target. So that makes the two aspects uh, match together. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. And I think, Jorge, you, you wanted to uh, add something? Yes. No, uh, I agree with Christine, you know, it was very clear about the, the relation of, of the different part of communication, scientific uh, community, the political community, that is, is clear. But I, I think it's important for communication is what, what you have to communicate. And because of this, is uh, the information is, is very important and the access to information is, is, is a very important issue. Uh, for, for, for politicians, I think the, the responsibility is to put the information in a, in, in a space where the, the people can uh, understand and can access and understand what is there and that can use this information for their own uh, necessity. Uh, and part of this are the, 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 the academic community that have particular, as, as he said, uh, form of communicate and uh, it, 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 what politicians need really is to build bridges uh, between the different actors that are related in, in, in and that, that they have different form of communication to 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 have the, 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 the space to bring this 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 information coming from the different actors so the decision makers 
and then uh, use the information in the in the right form. Sorry. Yes, and, and following up on that, there are a couple of questions related to examples, good cases around the world of, of good groundwater governance that we can speak of, that we can learn from too. I know, Kirsten, you, you earlier, you said you had some additional uh, uh, yes. case studies, maybe you want to highlight, especially if there's good examples of uh, what we were talking about communications or stakeholder involvement, uh, uh, things of those, that nature. I'm not sure I can respond on the communications, but I can, I can think about it and see if I can uh, post something in the chat. Um, in terms of the the other um, engagements that I didn't mention, um, I think the Morocco uh, uh, work is important. I can't speak as much to the outcomes. I think one area where we, uh, one case that I highlighted was the, the case in China where we really saw very clear outcomes. I mean, I wish I could show you guys the graphs, but you could see very clear, clearly that the work done there, the combination of the remote sensing technology, the work with the Water Users Association, addressing water rights and water pricing resulted in some very clear positive outcomes um, in that region, which was um, a, a drylands region. Um, but I'll also talk about the, the case in, in Morocco, the work in Morocco, I should say, um, where we provided some, some budget support um, to the government, uh, specifically uh, to work with them on green growth. And groundwater management was um, a measurable indicator in that work. Um, and so um, what was really used was groundwater management contracts. And these were um, supported to, uh, uh, were used to support institutions to address um, incentives that were in place for over abstraction. So essentially um, the contracts were a structured way of um, counterbalancing the perverse incentive, if you will, for over abstraction and shifting it to a more balanced um, groundwater use. So I think that's another example where it was, let's say more of a single instrument approach, um, but that can be a, a very useful thing for, for other regions to consider as well. So maybe I'll stop there and, and allow the other panelists to come in with, with some examples. Does anybody have any examples they would like to share? Okay, Jorge? Yeah, I, I, I think that the groundwater management have different scales. Uh, at the local level, that are very important because drills, the wells are locally drilled, the extraction are local. Then it are very important to resolve the problem in relation with, with, with uh, the, the local situation. There are situations that are national problems that are resolved by project or by the policy. And the, there are also regional projects. Uh, and the, the result and the, the, and the objective of this project are totally different in some case. I, I can uh, talk about the, uh, the result of the, uh, the regional project that we work in, in, in the Americas, in the Guarani aquifer, that with the World Bank, that was really a success. And the, the result was a, a, a lot of knowledge about this aquifer, but not a knowledge known by, by each one of the country. It's a regional knowledge and a common uh, uh, understanding of the reality of the aquifer, that is a transboundary aquifer, and, and how the, to protect it and how to, to, to use. And at the end, as a result, there is an, uh, an agreement on the way in between the, the four countries to uh, agree how to manage and how to use the, 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 the groundwater in the case of this aquifer. And this is the base for the second project that we are, I informed in, the, in my presentation for uh, the moni to monitoring the, the, the aquifer that will start soon. I think Connor, did you want to uh, jump in? 
Yeah, I was just going to um, highlight an example from Ireland. So under the Water Framework Directive, we have broken our, our country down into surface water bodies and groundwater bodies. And in assessing the, in characterizing our surface water bodies, we've taken account of the underlying aquifers and the pathways. So most of our country, most of our agriculture, shall we say, is pasture-based dairy or, or beef. And there's a lot of nutrient issues. And in free draining areas, it tends to be issues with nitrate. And you know, you've got your, your compliance um, issues, you've got enforcement and you've got rules, but to go beyond that where communication comes into it, in rules and enforcement will only get you so far. And we've now set up a system of um, essentially free agricultural advisors that will come onto people's farms where we've identified issues, shall we say, with nitrate to loss to groundwater issues. And they will, speaking the farmer's language and essentially bringing it back to agronomics show how money is being lost through nutrient loss and how that can be stemmed, how it can be win for the farmer and win for the environment. It's, it's softly, softly, it's, it's engagement and it's, it's collegiate. It's, it's not the enforcement stick, but it, you know, enforcement and rules will only get you so far. So this shows you, you need that, that communication, that, that working together piece to actually you know, achieve outcomes in many of these areas. It's, it's early days yet. It's only been in place a couple of years. But the hope is that this can be, you know, um, a large part of the solution in future to bringing um, water bodies that are currently not meeting their their environmental objective up to up to compliance. Okay, thank you, uh, Rosario. Yes, we have other question here. How do we adapt our legal systems to climate change so that there is enough robustness but also flexibility? And they set an example, will the WDF be adapted or other instruments across the world that you're aware of? That is, sorry, I, I, I didn't understand the, the question. How, the yes, yes. How do we adapt our legal systems to climate change so that there is enough robustness in the system, but also flexibility because of the challenges and the uncertainty that we're facing? Does anyone want to try to take uh, take this on? <laughs> it's a hard one. <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah. I want to give it to you, Gabriel. You're the lawyer. <laughs> no, I mean, there are questions for you, Gabriel, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing that came to uh, the first reaction I have is that you know legal frameworks are notoriously not flexible and adaptable. You know, so I think to some extent we can't ask. Uh, these frameworks to do something that they aren't really um, in a very fundamental way designed to do. Um, we even see this with how legal frameworks try and address issues of, of technology, data privacy. I mean, it's, they're simply not able to keep up quite yet. Um, at the same time, I think frameworks like the EU Water Framework Directive and, and things that operate at on a principle that allows, that provides some higher level uh, guidance for how governments or the global community would like to address these things, but also gives clear parameters um, of how they can be downscaled to the local level and adapted at the local level um, and provides for an appropriate level of discretion at the local level and also monitoring and oversight to accompany that discretion, I think is, a, is an interesting way to go. Um, so I'll hand it over to Gabriel <laughs> after that. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I mean, I, I don't wanna jump into this panel, but this you know, local adaptive uh, legal authority, I think, is is a really critical critical issue that I don't think we've explored enough uh, in most legal regimes. Uh, the, uh, Connor, please. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, the point you made earlier on, just in relation to the Water Framework Directive, it, it was brought up there um, that climate change, as a phrase, is not mentioned in the Water Framework Directive. Twenty years old now, but there is a circular from a number of years back that said. If when undertaking technical assessments for WFD assessment, you can consider climate change to be an anthropogenic pressure, given that it is human-induced climate change. So there is a, a facility there to account for it. 
I suppose the question then becomes, and again, it's a technical question, what do we consider baseline and do we allow our baseline to shift or do we set our environmental objectives um, based on, you know, objectives that will be unachievable in the future because what would be the, the baseline has shifted. So I suppose, you know, the law at a high level in Europe can take account of that and I'm not a lawyer, but I, you know, you can actually work in taking account of climate change on a technical level without going near the water framework directive itself, it will facilitate that. Um, secondly, um, in the European Union now, we are, member states are obliged to produce sectoral adaptation plans, climate adaptation plans. And, you know, we worked on our one in Ireland two years ago, and it was very much using the, the water framework directive as an adaptation lever. So, um, the, the, I suppose the plan that comes out of the water framework directive on a river basin level, the integrated catchment management plan, the river basin management plan, that was, that was listed repeatedly in our water sectoral adaptation plan in Ireland as a tool to achieve climate adaptation. So I think being, you know, you may not need new legislation. You may just need to very carefully link up the legislation that exists and decide what's in legislation, what's in regulation, what's in guidance. And the joining up of that, it, it's so siloed. It's very, very difficult to join that up effectively, but we may actually have sufficient law to do what we need to do. All right, great. Uh, Jorge, please. I, I think climate change is a, is a global issue. And then the countries uh, the work at the level of the convention. And we have a, the, the Paris Agreement, for example, that is, 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 a, is a, a, a responsibility of all the, 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 the countries, part of the convention to, to accomplish the, 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 the agreement. And each one has the, the proposal uh, for, for adaptation, for uh, emissions, uh, and, and then this is built internally in the country with the local organization, the local administration. Then I think this is, is a, a clear uh, chapeau, a, a legal chapeau for, for the countries in relation with the responsibility to, to adaptation and to mitigation to climate change. And uh, this have directly relation with water and how we, we, we extract the water, how we use the water and the, the, the impact of the water in the, in the ecosystem. Then we, we have a, a legal framework at, at the global level and this at the national level, we have also the different compromise that was uh, uh, presented to the convention uh, in, in this area. All right, thank you. So we're about to, to uh, wrap up this uh, panel. And I wanted to maybe throw one last question to, to everybody, uh, but ask you to keep your responses to one minute. Um, and what I want to ask is, what do you see as the biggest challenge to the science policy interface uh, in the coming years? And maybe, and again, in one minute, um, you know, if, if there is a, a solution or at least a direction that we should be going in. So, uh, Kirsten, we'll start with you. Okay, I think I'll, uh, I may just um, reiterate how I started. And I think part of that is, you know, the shift in uh, how our global and national institutions are, are operating uh, in a large part due to COVID um, and also just due to some prevailing political trends. I think this is really shifting how science and policy are interacting. Uh, in my very personal opinion, there's, we're observing more politicization. You can read the newspaper and observe that. Um, and so I think it's just something for us to be aware of. And, and I think it's part of the waves that we experience as, as a global society. Um, and what can we do? I think many of us here are, are scientists um, or scientists and policymakers combined. And I think we can keep our eye on the science, stay, stay sharp in our technical knowledge, improve our communication, uh, engage with beneficiaries and, and continue um, to, to move forward in the ways that we think will, will benefit society. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, Yon Yon? 
What do, what do you yeah, think? Just, uh, just the one word, I think uh, it's uh, to the big challenge for this interface is, uh, is understanding. For the policy makers, understand the scientific basis. For the scientific scientists, understand the policy choice. And also the both sides to understand the important uh, rules of the groundwater was playing in the whole water circle and also the water security. And also to understand the uh, fundamental technical mechanism of the groundwater. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yan Yan, uh, Jorge, please. For me, I, I think it's, it's very important uh, the, to, to stress the relations between the science community, the political community, uh, to resolve the local problems that are came from the stakeholders. And this is an issue of organization and communication, basically. Thank you. And Connor. Thank you. Uh, for me, I think specifically in relation to the science policy interface in groundwater and climate, the two biggest issues or the single biggest issue it's, they're connected are the uncertainty involved in the climate science and the rapid pace of change of the climate science. And that's the input that we're, that's the input we're going to use to come up with our, our groundwater outputs. Um, you look at it today, you've got, you know, an, uh, an increase in the pace of the melting of permafrost um uh, sea level rise etc the models seem to be while you know getting bleaker in their outputs also changing in their uncertainties and conveying messages that remain believable and timely and don't change to policymakers given that policy can be changed so slowly that is a, that is a very serious challenge all right thank you well thank you all for for participating um if if i have any takeaways uh from this uh it seems to me that uh, what might be most important for, for facilitating the science policy interface is that we have, you know, the institutions to help with bringing the people together from the science community, from the policy community, but also from stakeholders and the beneficiaries to, to, to bring them all to come and, 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 and uh, participate in the process. But also we need communications and we, we need translation. Uh, in terms of how do you speak to a particular community and explain the science or explain the policy or explain the local issues that are particularly important. And uh, I think the third thing that I think that I, my takeaway from, from, from this panel is that uh, transparency uh, is, is critical, that we must be able to share information and, and pass it you know, to all the different communities uh, and communicate that information in ways that, that it, it, in a public forum. So uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you all for uh, uh, engaging in this dialogue. Uh, Rosario has some, uh, a few uh, parting words uh, for our audience. So Rosario. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, the panelists. Really enjoyed this, this time with you. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping instructions again. We will collect your uh, written responses from presenters to any remaining questions. I know there were a lot of questions are there and we're still getting more questions. So once we received all of them, we will place the answers on the conference website. Uh, we also want to remind you that all that you can, um, that you can see an excellent selection of posters online at our website as well, IWRA online conference. The posters can be found under the posters menu. And if you have any questions on this, you can send us an email to online.conference at IWRA org and we will contact the poster authors to respond to your queries with regards to the powerpoint presentations we didn't have anyone here but uh, for other events we will also make them available soon on our conference website along with the recording of this session as well so thank you everyone and have well, a thank you evening. all thank you thank you uh kirsten conti uh yon yon lee jorge rooks and Connor Quinlan, really appreciate your time and participation in this panel. Thank you to the audience for joining us and uh, submitting your questions and being involved in this. And I'm gonna turn this uh, back over. Uh, we have another session coming up uh, quite soon. So uh, goodbye, everyone. Thank you goodbye. Very much.
Goodbye. Bye. Bye.